Hello, everyone. Ellie, I was going to tell you, I did not find what you might have been talking about, so I think I'm making it up. I'm not sure if Michael looked into me too, but yes, I'm going to try and do this from my living room today. Usually I've been doing it uh, in another room, but we'll see. The connection is better here. But yes, I have this cat. This is Sabrina. Oh, is this Sabrina? Yes, this is Sabrina. I have two black cats. Yes, that's fine. Thanks for letting me know, Gabby. Yeah, I have two black cats, so I have to look at their faces. They look different. They do look different, but I just have to um, make sure. All right, get rid of this. Yeah, so uh, her name is Sabrina, and then her older brother's name is Salem. And it is because of Sabrina the Teenage Witch, yes. Yeah, he's he's up next to me, sleeping up from me, so he likes to be in high spots. All right, welcome, everyone. Clearly, you can hear me. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. That can be cut out. So are we seeing the PowerPoint? Good. All right. Welcome, everyone. We're in week five here. So we only have through week eight. So we're getting close to the end here. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about national identity and defining Korean art, which a lot of you have really great thoughts on your responses. So I'm looking forward to what we discuss today. Um, so everyone should have got uh, their midterm back to them on like Sunday night or Monday morning. And you should have received a link in your email that it was an it was a um, an outlook share or SharePoint share kind of a thing. So I, I, I get emails when everyone clicks on theirs or accesses it. And I think almost I think everyone did. So if you didn't receive a link in your email, your KU email to your midterm, with my comments on it, please do so. But um, I wanted to say congratulations. You are the first class that I've ever taught where everyone submitted this midterm on time. Um, so that's pretty cool. And I think because of that, you have also the highest average I've ever had, which is an A minus, which is extremely good. You know, some, if you take some classes, they have to curve it so hard that a C becomes an A and whatnot. But I think it's really great that we don't have to do that for our class, right? So um, the only thing that I want to say is talking about, I don't think I've discussed this directly in, cl in class before, is the citations, the quotes, and paraphrases. So please remember that the purpose for you to have to cite something or refer back to a reading is in order to use that text is to use textual evidence to support your interpretation, right? So um, you need to do something more than just putting a random quote in the paragraph. And some of you do, some of you are totally fine. And some of you, I can tell you're just doing it because you're like, okay, I need to get some kind of quote in there. So going forward, if you don't contextualize or explain why that quote um, is important to what you're trying to say in your response, I'm not going to give you points for it. Um, I've, I think everyone who did it, I commented on it in the midterm, um, but just in general, be aware of this. And if I see it again, uh, I'll let you know, um, but... Yeah, so you need to put something like, according to the author, dot, 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 therefore, or as the author said, right? Um, so just make sure you explain why that's, why what you're quoting is important. Does that make sense? I think some of us worry more about, oh, I need to get a citation in. So they, we just put something that sounds good, but, you know, we got to make sure that we explain why. 
And that's not just for this class, that's for every class and every time you do any kind of writing. All right, good. So, all right, not that many announcements today. So let's get to our attendance question. A lot of us have been thinking about this. So what is national identity? And along with that, who decides what a national identity is and how do we express national identity? What are your thoughts here? Think back to the readings, think to your own, your personal experiences with this idea of national identity. Turn my, this on. All right, what do we think? Well, I think my uh, chat is being very slow. Good. So traditions, right? So traditions as in like things that have been done a long time ago and we continue to do up to this point. Good. And how a nation interprets itself. So yeah, so the stories that a nation tells about itself um, the way it perceives itself. Yes, it unites people, exactly. People within a country or nation, they are united around this identity, right? It's something that they're supposed to share with each other. Um, yes, it can be like motifs. So like if we're talking about art, which is what we're going to be talking about today, it can be like symbols or icons or certain kinds of just consistent things that you see throughout artworks or in visual or material culture. Good, unique aspects of a particular culture, right? We're going to talk about that. Um, yes, what um, a nation can be or how it came to be. Yeah, there you go. So foundation myths, right? So this idea of where the nation comes from is very integral to the national identity. Yes, um, characteristics associated, associated with the people too, right? So it's not just the country itself, but like the very specific people who live within that space or come from that space, right? They're supposedly share certain characteristics. Good. Um, let's see, da, 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 bring people together. Feels collectively good. So uh, there's a collective feeling about it, right? So again, people are supposed to be united around this identity. Good, da, da, da. show national pride. Good, national pride, right? So it's something you should be proud of, right? It's something you're supposed to, um, you know, you're supposed to say, oh, I'm an American or I'm a Korean, right? It's supposed to be something that you are proud of. Good, good. So good, here we go. That was about, I was about to ask. So who decides this, right? So Hayden says it's the people who decide this identity, right? So the people, yes, who else? There's something... Um, um, I'll give you a hint. There's kind of a top-down approach to this, the way this identity is built as well. Who else? Could the people throughout the years slowly cultivating, right? Okay, the people. There's a particular institution. Yes, there you go. I agree. The people for sure, but then definitely the government, right? So uh, whether we're in the U.S. or whether we're in South Korea or North Korea, right, the government really, the, 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 you know, the government, which is the institution that's supposed to keep everyone in that nation connected together, has a huge stake in making sure that people um, feel a sense of connection with this national identity, right? They have to do that. So. Yeah, like we've been saying, it's this idea of the common, what we have in common with each other um, as people who all are within or belong to or come from a nation, right? So history, culture, symbols, memories, values, all of these things, right? Which we've all basically said here. So what are the pros and cons to having a strong or a good sense of national identity? Let's start with the pros. What are some of the good aspects of having and maintaining a national identity within a country. Community, yes, absolutely. It, it gives us a feeling like we belong, right? Absolutely. When we feel like we're a part of the nation, we feel like we're sharing something with each other. And it feels good. It feels good to be a part of a community. You know, humans are social creatures. We wanna feel like we belong. Good. 
Unification. Yes, exactly. Good. Sense of belonging. Good. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one of the main reasons is basically all having to do with this sense of belonging and community. So first reduces conflicts, right, within a society. So if everyone feels, feels like they're part of a community, they might be less apt to fight with each other. Um, that sense of community like we've been talking about. Uh, and then there's also kind of a more practical sense too, which is what you might call social cohesion. So if everyone in the nation celebrates the same holidays and has the same values, then it's a lot easier to um, organize events or organize what should be taught in school or what should be um, what should be people's uh, uh, what's the word here? What they should be valuing higher than what other things, right? I don't like to use that value your values, but, uh, and that sense of pride, right? So it's good to feel like you're proud of yourself. It's good to have that kind of, um, that um, sense of confidence, right? What about the cons? What are some negative aspects of national identity? Exclusion, yes, foreigners, right? So um, this idea that people who are not part of the nation somehow are, they shouldn't be allowed in or they they should be, you know, should be ostracized for some reason, right? And so that can manifest in a lot of ways. In general, there's the word xenophobia, which means fear of outsiders or fear of foreigners. Um, but racism is definitely part of that. And then the violence, so the violence that's rooted in that, right? Maybe too egotistical, which kind of breeds that exclusionary, um, mentality, right? Good. You can ignore the faults of the nation. Exactly. You kind of look at your country with rose colored glasses, right? And then you start when it starts coming to have to look at policies or history, particularly, you have a skewed view of what actually happens in history. Stereotypes. Yeah, exactly. So this um, idea that everyone is basically the same, right? Yes, and then superiority complex ethnocentrism. Very good, yeah. So the distortion of history, right? So always thinking you're the good guy or um, it could be the opposite too, which tends to be in the Korea case, always thinking you're the victim, especially with 20th century history. Um, the us versus them mentality. So that goes back to the xenophobia, the ethnocentrism, superiority complex. Um, and then essentialism, which is this idea that everyone in one country is the same basically, right? So what are some differences between the national identity in the US versus Korea? So let's talk about these a little bit. Um, so in the US, we're culturally, we're much more culturally diverse than Korea. So we tend to have that as like, and so we tend to have this myth or this idea of the nation of immigrants, right? Whereas in Korea, because they're a little bit more culturally ho homogenous, their sense of national nationalism doesn't come from the idea of a bunch of different people coming together. It actually comes from this by a lot more of a biological um, kind of uh, what is the connection that everyone's supposed to have. Like everyone is derived biologically from the same ancestors. So that idea is more prominent in the Korean national identity than it is in the U.S. national identity, right? Um, and so because of that, the U.S. has to focus a lot more on abstract ideas like freedom and liberty, which, you know, are the basis for democracy. And it preaches those over and over, right? Like land of the free, even though in the 21st century, there's an awful lot of countries that are also lands of the free, right? Um, but the U.S. is supposedly the first. So they keep that. Um, and... But then in Korea, they have more of an emphasis on, in addition to biology, uh, these kind of heavenly foundation myths. So this idea that their country is rooted somewhere in, from heaven. Um, so there's this creation myth about um, this Prince Tangun who was sent down from the heavens, from the heavenly kings. And there's a bear and a, and a um, tiger and they are forced to starve themselves and then the tiger lives and eats the bear or something like this. It's very, it's kind of convoluted. We're not gonna learn about it really, but just know that it exists and it's something that is uh, commonly talked about in Korean national identity. Um, and then for sure, I think one of the biggest differences is what we're talking about with that skewed history. So the US has the narrative of the hero, right? Everything, the US exceptionalism, everything about the US is great. 
Whereas in Korea, they do have a sense uh, that they're great, um, but it's more because they've overcome so much hardship, right? Which is what we've seen in class over the past few weeks, particularly, is this idea of Korea being that victim through the 20th century and surviving to this day, right? But between the two, there's a lot of kind of basic commonalities, which are probably common to almost all national identities, right? So you'll find monuments to historical figures in both. You'll find um, consistent symbols um, between within Korean national identity and within U.S. national identity, right? And you'll find colors that are consistent. And then what we're talking about today is the fact that material and visual culture are very important to the way that national identity is thought of and also represented. So what is the national identity of an artwork or object? So if I asked you, what is the national identity of this artwork? What are some things that you would have to think about in order to ans answer that question? What questions would you have to ask yourself in order to think about what is the nationality or the national identity of an artwork? What are some what are some things? So the artist, okay, what about the artist though? What would you need to what would you need to take into consideration about the artist? Good, okay, so style. Style can tell you a little bit about the nationality of an artwork, right? So what it looks like um, and how that might reflect da, 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 the region, right? The region where it's from, exactly. So where does the artist come from, right? Exactly, um, where does the artist come from? Or maybe even more vaguely, what's their background? Yeah, that's something we ask a lot nowadays um, in the 2020s because usually it's a little bit more complicated than just where's the artist from, right? Um, when was it made? Yes, exactly. So when was it made? What was the name of the place during that time that it was made, right? The medium, the medium could be important. It could tell us something specific about where it came from and what resources were there, right? Good, yeah. So basically the way that we get ideas about the national identity of an artwork um, are through all of these things, what we've been saying here. And this identity can be expressed through all these different ways. Um, but what's important to understand is that a lot of this is something that happens in retrospect. So the nationality or the national identity of an artwork refers to the way that it looks. So the style, the genre, or the iconography, or the way that it's made. So that could be the medium, the form, size, format. And it seems particular to a particular group of people from a particular time based on how we look at it in the present, right? So it's something we see about the past and then bring as our interpretation in the present, right? And so that's what we want to think about when we're talking about the readings and this idea of Korean art, how what we think or the way we understand it today as a national art is reflective of our conditions and looking back at the conditions during that time. So does that make sense kind of? Do you see how you might, we'll start seeing how this is gonna happen. So what object or artwork primarily represents Korean art? A lot of you had some qualms with this particularly. What was the kind of art that seems to be like, oh, this is Korean art when we talk about Korean art? What was the kind of object or artwork? And the readings talked about it over and over again. John didn't talk about it over and over again, but he didn't mention it. But Horlick definitely talked about it. Yes, Celadon, 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 Celadon. Korea, Korea ceramics, Celadon, pottery, ceramics. Exactly, stuff that looks like this, right? Um, so, and you notice this came into the museum. This is from the Cleveland Museum of Art. Um, and this came in in 1917. So they were collecting this um, as early as what Horlick was writing about, right, in the U.S. Horlick was focused more on the um, the British Empire case, but in the U.S. as well. So 
What's Horlick's argument exactly about Claudia Celadon? What is she trying to say about about um, why people are so obsessed with it or were so obsessed with it? What was she? What were some of the things she was saying about it? Okay, so rarity. So um, I can't remember if she says that outright. So uh, how do I say this? That can be a tough word because that can be a tough word to use because um, it kind of depends on who you talk to. So it was rare, definitely, to have it in the early 20th century, but actually, it was the most common um, type of ceramics from Korea that was in the market at the time. So it was kind of rare because not a lot of museums had it, but at the same time, it was easy to collect it. And so because they started collecting it a lot, it became not rare anymore, if that kind of makes sense. So I would kind of um, st stray away. I saw many people said rarity. I would stray away from that idea just because it's a little situational. But yes, here we go. So Amelia, differentiate. It was easy to differentiate. Yeah, there was viewed to be something about it that was different from Chinese and Japanese ceramics, right? So it was seen to be the most Korean art. Well, why? Why was it seen to be the most Korean art though? Good, it didn't It didn't look similar, right? There was something about it. Good, yes, there's this idea of the heyday, right? The heyday of Korea um, was the Goryeo period, right? And this was something that was from it. And we could use this to understand how Goryeo was like the best time in Korean history. Yes, it was viewed as unique, right? um yes so it was funerary it was a funerary funerary element more appealing so good yeah so those are some reasons why but i think what horlick is trying to say here and and i think a lot of you got to it is that the idea of it being unique to korea is not inherent to the object itself but rather based on some of the the social conditions the historical conditions of the late 19th and early 20th century that are going on so it's not that Korean Celadon or Korea Celadon is what we're saying it is here or the what people said it was, but rather that they're saying that because there's certain other things happening at the time that are making them say that or making them want to uh, put that narrative onto the objects. So what were some of those contexts? What were some of the social contexts going on late 19th, early 20th century um, that were making people want to find unique Korean art. And then they labeled Korea Celadon that way. Do you remember? A lot of you talked about this actually, because I think a lot of us were a little bit upset about this, but it's the truth. It's kind of what happened. Okay, so that's um, later. So we're gonna talk about Korean War and the Communist China later. But yes, talking about we're talking about Horlick's article right now. Yes, good. Recovery from Japanese colonization. So yeah, under Japanese colonization, Japanese imperialism, um this was these were the objects that Japan Japanese collectors and the Japanese colonial government really wanted to position as good Korean art, right? So um there's a couple of different things. So we have in the US, they're looking for this national art and antiquities, right? And so like we've said here, Korean paintings seem too Chinese and Celadon is different from its Chinese counterpart, right? Um, and then there's the Japanese colonial archeology span historiography taste, right? That gets transferred over to these European or US um, collectors. Um, so they were excavating all these tombs. And so this is why I, I say get get away from the word rare, because the Japanese colonial government excavated a lot of Goryeo tombs and also old Goryeo kilns where this celadon was made. So although it might have been rare at one point, the reason it would became so popular is because it was becoming so accessible. Um, and then there was Goryeo good, Chosun bad. What? 
why is the reason that the Japanese imperial or Japanese colonial narrative about Korea, why would they say Korea is good, but Joseon is bad? Did anyone kind of understand why you would want to do that? Why would a colonial power want to say that about one of its colonies? What's the reason for that? Yes, very good. Yes, paternalism. That's a very great that's a very great word. Yes. Um yeah, so if you're colonizing or you want to take on a colony and you want to make it look like you as a colonial power are doing good things for the people there, you have to create some narrative about history in order to validate it. And one of the things they tried to say was frame Joseon as bad, um as something in need of intervention right? Um, they were backwards. Um, yes. So that made it seem like, oh, Korea needed Japan to colonize it because we are going to take it back on track. And in order to also suggest that they could do that, they framed Korea as like this good counterpart to Joseon. So it's this idea that at one point in history, Korea was great. And then it, um, what's the word? it deteriorated or denigrated and now we're here to bring it back to that former glory particularly of Korea and so do you see how framing Korea Celadon as uniquely Korean and therefore the best kind of art can help play into that narrative right so but then there's this also this interesting and idea that Celadon somehow speaks to the essence of Korean people as like sorrowful and lonely, right? So then we have this exhibition of masterpieces of Korean art, which is in the late 1950s. So what is Jong trying to say? What does he want you to think about this exhibition? What does he want you to come away with? What is his argument? What do we think? Some of us got to a little bit earlier. I don't know if my chat is slow today or if we're a little bit slow to remember what's going on in the readings. So remember, so he was talking about how it was about formulating that national identity, right? And it had two kind of sides to the mission. Yeah, here we go. Yes, exactly, good. So the US particularly was trying to help construct a narrative about Korea. Very good, Elizabeth. Yeah, and one of the things that they did was they focused a lot on Celadon, right? And downplay other Asian influences in Korean art. Very good. So there's basically two missions, right, of this exhibition. So there was the outward, which is for Korea to gain recognition in the Cold War um, as an ally to the U.S., right? And then there's the inward, which is to take that recognition and bring it back to South Korea and say, yes, we are accepted, right? We are accepted um, on the world stage and as an ally to U.S. American people. But here are some facts about the exhibition. So it went on for two years, it toured for two years. It had 167,000 visitors in eight U.S. cities. Does that sound like a lot of visitors or not a lot of visitors, considering the context of how many cities this toured? Yeah, not a lot. So I, I don't think he really talks about this, but... When we think back about exhibitions, it is important to think about what kind of reach that they had. And I'm not sure that this exhibition had a huge amount of reach that probably the South Korean government at the time or even the U.S. government had hoped for, right? Um, 167,000 visitors, you would hope that would be in one city alone, right? Um, there's 193 objects, 109 were ceramics, 35 paintings, 24 sculptures, and 18 metal crafts. All of them were from the National Museum of Korea. And so like we said, 
of the 193 objects, well over half of them are all what kind of, what medium, what kind of object are they? I know the answer might seem obvious, but it's important to really recognize this. Yeah, they're all ceramics, right? So they're not just all celadon or Claudia celadon. There was there was also um, some porcelain and some earthenware and, and things like that as well. But overwhelmingly, it was ceramics, yeah. So why? What were some of the reasons that they gave? Um, so they wanted unique Korean artifacts. Yeah, they didn't want Chinese influence, right? So what was the reason for not wanting Chinese influence? What was the reason? There's a there's not one answer to this. There's a couple of different reasons. They didn't want to show any kind of Chinese influence connection. Yeah, I think it's definitely the opposition at the time in the U.S. to China, right? So China had just underwent its communist uh, revolution in 1949 and established the People's Republic of China. They were under Mao and Mao is China and um, the U.S. were not friendly. They did not like that. Yeah. So there's the Cold War context there, right? Yeah. And then there's also just this idea of wanting Korean art to look distinct, right? They want to show Korea as something that's very unique. Good. Um, and so there were also U.S. scholars who were trained in Japanese art. And so you can, if you think about the earlier context from Charlotte Horlick, you can see how they would follow the earlier taste in Korean art, right? Which was for this Gordia Celadon. Um, John, does John contextualize this though? Does he put this in conversation with, with Horlick's article or what Horlick talks about at all? Did anyone notice? He really, he really doesn't. Um, he just kind of acts like these two curators, um, Priest and who's the other one? I know Alan, I know who Alan Priest is really well. And um, uh, was it Payne? Um, they did have training in Korean art and they had an idea about Korean art, but it was through Japanese art and the Japanese colonial taste. And like I said, yeah, it was the Cold War real politic, right? Form South Korean national identity. So what is it called, an exhibition like this, when one nation uses culture to gain the support of another nation? What is that called? Does anyone, some of you use this term in your responses. Yes, soft power, exactly, soft power. So soft power. So it's use of culture or economics to influence international relations. So John doesn't really context use this term right but i think this is really important to understand um so soft power can be exercised through museum exhibitions corporate expansion overseas exchange student programs for even foreign language classes can be an example of soft power and a lot of you mentioned a very um big form of soft power coming from south korea all across the globe in your responses what do you, well, today, one that's going on today, and we'll talk about it in like two weeks, what is that big thing, this big form of soft power that South Korea is really trying to use and capitalize off of? How do you, yes, how do you, K-pop, yeah, so the Korean wave, yeah, the K-culture, right? So we're going to talk about that in two weeks, but yes, huge, it's huge, right? So it's important to recognize this is different from what's called hard power, which is the use of force. So particularly like military force. And we don't usually contextualize military force as hard power, but that's kind of the opposite, the, the juxtaposition that these ideas are trying to, to bring forward. So think about um, Russia invading Ukraine in, I think 2022, was that in 2022 or 2021? I think it was early 2022. Um, the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan, right, in 2001. So these are um, for use, the use of force that's more like exercising hard power. So let's look at some of the artworks that were in the exhibition and just try to decide together what exactly could be construed as Korean about it or uniquely Korean. So let's look at this one here. So this is a painting. It's called Boat Ride on a Clear River. 
It's from 1805. It's by a named artist named Shin Yun Bok, who is actually a pretty um, famous artist during his time. Um, it is in ink and like and light color. Light color just means it's colored ink on paper. So what do you think? What about this? What about this painting just feels or looks Korean specifically? What do you think? If you had to guess or just based on what you see, what might you say? Yes, I think so too. I think it's the clothing. Yeah, it could be the clothing, right? So um, during this time, they did not use the word humble. They just said, they just used the Korean words for it. So jogori, which is the shirt, and chima, which is the skirt. Um, Paji, which is pants, that's what they called it. But in the 20th century, they started getting this idea of humble as opposed to the westernized clothing, right? Yeah, exactly. So, and I think you can really see here the different gendered clothing um, art items that the that the women and men are wearing, right? They're quite different and they are pretty specific to what people would have worn in Joseon during the time. Very good, yeah. I think so. Text. So this is actually Chinese. These are actually Chinese characters. So did we did I mention this before? So oh yes, I mentioned that last week, right? So before the 20th century, uh Korean was primarily written in Chinese characters, not in Korean characters, which is called Hangul. Um, and so this is from a time when really only Chinese characters were were used. But I guess, you know, some things of Chinese influence cannot really be avoided, right, in trying to find, you know, uniquely Korean artworks. All right, Tiger. So this is, um, let's think about this one. So this one's an unrecorded artist. They used to, this, is, this is pretty interesting because they used to think this was a um, really famous artist artwork, but they've changed recently like within the past decade they changed that they don't think it's that person's artwork anymore but this is tiger um about the 18th century so 1700s joseon it's ink it's on a hanging scroll it's part of the national museum of korea why might a tiger be a good example of something uniquely korean i would be impressed if someone knows some of the history behind this if anyone who's learning Korean or has taken another course about Korea, what have you heard about tigers in Korea? Yes, tiger is the national symbol of Korea. It is. It's one of the national um, symbols of Korea for sure. So, um, so these are some examples of tigers and other artworks. So these are both Joseon. This is a this is a painting of the tiger and a magpie. And then this is a painting of the same thing. So tiger and magpie is a um, folk tale about basically a magpie. So it's kind of complicated, but basically a tiger gets stuck in mud and he finds the, a woodcutter comes by and he tries to get the tiger stuck out of the mud. But then the tiger's like, if you do that, I'm going to eat you. And then basically he, the woodcutter asks a bunch of different trees, other animals, but then he asks the magpie and says, oh, well, why don't you, why don't you have the tiger go stand in the mud, in the mud again? And then I'll let you know if you can reenact the situation, I'll let you know if he should eat you or not. And then the tiger goes and stands in the mud and he gets stuck again, basically. So he can't eat the, the, the woodcutter who saved him. So anyways, all that is the same. The reason is because tigers used to live in Korea. There used to be a, a type of tiger lived in Korea, but they were basically hunted to extinction. Um, so they're not there anymore, but that's why um, tigers are very prominent. And then in also in folk beliefs particularly, tigers were viewed as um, like spirits of the mountain because they were very prominent. So that's part of the reason why. Tigers were there. That's why they're a national symbol. Does that make sense? You will never see, you won't see a tiger again in this in this class. But and then there's this one. So what were some of the reasons that this, the round, this is a round box from um with the lid. It's from 1100 to 200. It's Gordia blue green glaze with white and black inlay decoration. Why is this uniquely Korean? What are some of the reasons? What are some of the reasons this is Korean?
Yes. Yeah, so good. So the color, the use of the lighter or the brighter glaze. Yeah. The pattern, maybe the pattern. We're going to learn a little bit about the pattern in a bit. The flower, we're going to learn about the flower in a bit too. Um, does anyone remember the the special technique that was regarded as uniquely Korean? The technique in decorating something? Does anyone remember what this is called? So this idea of inlay, this idea of inlay is supposedly uniquely Korean. And we're going to learn what that is. So, so what is Korean about Celadon? So this is from the exhibition um, book which, yes, the slip inlay, very good. Yeah, we're going to learn how that works. So in the exhibition book, they specifically say um, that the Korea Celadon is more distinct from Chinese objects, right? And then they always come back to this quote from a guy from the Song Dynasty, which is like, uh, uh, what is it, 1000? I think this is actually from 11, the 1100s. It's from either the 1100 or 1200s. Um, there was a Song Dynasty traveler so from China, who went to, to Goria, and he said, the secret color of Goria Celadon is the first under heaven. So there's this idea that even the Song Dynasty, even the Chinese really appreciated the color of Celadon. And he, he kind of accidentally coined this term secret color, which is what um, people use even to this day to talk about Goria Celadon. Um, but there's actually a lot of different shades of the blue-green color or the green color, even within uh, Cordia Celadon. So we have this one here on the left, and this one is supposedly not typical. And then this one here on the right is supposedly typical. Um, but so what do you notice about these two colors? What's kind of, how would you describe, how would you describe, the, how would you describe the way they compare to each other? What do you think? Yes, exactly. So the quote unquote typical one is more like a, has a bluer blue green to it. Um, whereas the atypical one is more of a beige. I like that neutral. Good. I like mint green. That's good. Yeah. Um, Negative space is lighter. Yeah, sure. Yeah, exactly. The left one is just overall much more darker while the right one is, is more vibrant. But the reality is that these were being made at about the same amount of, for about the same amount of time. These This is, in this particular example, there's about a hundred years of difference. But um, they're made at different kilns, actually. This one is made in kilns that are in the south of Korea. And this one, I believe, is from the Kaesong kilns, which is more in like the middle. And these were like royal kilns at the time. Yeah, exactly. So like bright green versus neutral. Yeah, exactly. And so when they talk about the secret color, though, what they're really referring to is this one here on the right, this more like blue green or light green color. Um, so there's a lot of different ceramics in Korea, and you don't need to have this memorized, but um, Gordia Celadon is referred to as like the earliest glazed ceramics. Um, and this is like blue green, blue green glazed ceramics or green glazed ceramics. And then after Celadon, there's two kinds of ceramics that are really common among Chosun ceramics. The earlier ones are called Buncheng. There's no, there's no English equivalent to this term. It's just Buncheng. And they're kind of a they're kind of derived from a celadon or a blue green glazed um, glaze um, with some iron in it. And um, those were popular for about the 200 years, uh, 1400 to the 1600s. But then starting in the 1600s, we see a shift where in later Joseon, they really value this like white porcelain color, especially with this, what's called cobalt blue underglaze. So they paint a cobalt blue glaze under it and do all these very beautiful designs. Um, and that became popular later. So there's a lot more to Korean ceramics than just the Celadon. And there's even earlier um, earthenware, which is not glazed, um, which some of you talked about even in your responses as well. So yeah, you're right. Like even just Gordia Celadon by themselves, that really cannot represent the comprehensive history of even ceramics in Korea. 
All right, so let's practice our visual analysis of a ceramic object. So was everyone able to watch or have time to watch the video by Professor Stiller about describing a ceramic object and the techniques and stuff like that, or look over the, the toolbox? Good, good, I'm glad. That's gonna be really helpful for you. And what we do here is we're, we're gonna practice putting that to work um, because you're gonna have to do that for your visual analysis assignment after class. Uh, in addition to thinking about the readings again. So you want to describe, we want to always make sure whenever you're describing a ceramic object, you have a little bit of something about each of these aspects. So the type. So type refers to what kind of object is it? So is it a bottle? Is it a cup? Is it a box? Is it a, a sculpture? Like a it looks like a human or looks like an animal. You'll see those too, right? So you want to clarify that. Um, in addition, I should say you obviously want to clarify the time period um, and the culture if you can. So, Korea. Um, and then you're going to, so qualifying the glaze. Describing the glaze is saying something like it's blue green glaze, or, or it can be green glazed, or it can be um, celadon. Um, you can, you know, say something like that, right? And if you want to, you can even talk a little bit more specifically about how this object looks. So is it shiny? Does it have a lot of little um, like bubble looking things in it? If you can look close enough, um, those are called crackles. You don't necessarily need to know that word, but um, that could be something that you want to think about. Uh, is it more dull, right? What color is it? Is it a bright green? Is it a light, is it a light green? Is it a darker green? Is it more um, olive? So you want to qualify the color for sure. Um, oh, sorry. Um, and then the body shape. The body shape. So people who talk, who write about ceramics and ceramicists themselves, sometimes they are very. They talk about a ceramic object like it's a like it's a human body or like a biological like a, a biological body in a lot of ways. So there's the lip. So the lip is this top part here that kind of curves outward. Um, not everything has a very obvious lip like that, but it's essentially that circle or it could be a square or rectangle or some other shape that is around the hole in the vessel, right? The shoulder, the shoulder is this part that kind of curves outward. Um, or if it's a bowl, it's kind of that part that curves, um, what, oh, what were the terms that they use? Convex versus concave. So, Convex is like this, right? And then concave or is like um, the way this vase looks. And then convex is if it goes inward and curves out, right? So um, think about the shoulder and what shape it is. Uh, the foot. So the foot, um, so the foot is, you can't see the foot right now, but I'll show you what it looks like. The foot is if this part down here kind of has a um, indent on it. And I'll show you a picture later, but it's basically, it's the bottom part under the vessel um, if, if it has a little indent. And then the base, which is the part that's indented inwardly. Um, and I'll show you those soon in a moment. And then you wanna talk about the decorations, right? So there's something called registers. So registers are if there's patterns that go around the body of the object, you say how many different patterns you can count um, on the object and um, those one pattern is a register basically. Um, motifs, so basically those icons or symbols which we've been talking about in class before and the technique. So how was it decorated? Was it incised? So someone took a knife and carved it. Was it inlaid? Um, which I'll describe in a moment. Was it painted? Something like this. Okay. So let's talk about this one. So what type of object is this ceramic object in the picture here? What would you say for the type of object that it is? It's a vase, it could be a vase. Um, there's another word, yes, bottle. Bottle is actually more common to see in the context of East Asian ceramics. Um, because vase we usually think of in Europe and North America as like something you put flowers in. But these were not used for that. These were not used for flowers. And we'll talk about what they were used for a little later. But um, so I would actually encourage you to use the term bottle, but you're not going to lose points if you say vase. But yeah, so um, bottle or um, 
Oh, plum flower vase. Oh, that should be, that should say bottle. I think the professor changed that. Yeah. So it could be a jar too. Um, so it could be a wine storage jar, um, plum flower, plum flower vase or byung. This word byung means bottle in Korean. Um, so that should be written here too. I'm sorry about that. Good. So um, the glaze. What would you say about the glaze? What color is it? What kind of glaze is it? Um, what kind of texture does it have to it? Can you tell based on this picture here? Yeah, it looks almost gray. Yeah, I've seen this in person and it is kind of has a grayish tint to it. You're right. Um, but I actually think it's pretty shiny. If you see it in person, you can kind of tell. But it is gray white but yeah it's it's definitely green um a celadon color it has that blue green and it's glossy very good yeah glossy yeah celadon blue green glaze um glossy anything like that good so the body shape let's start with yeah let's start with the lip what would, might you say about the lip of this object Yeah, it's rounded, large, good, yeah, round. You definitely want to talk about the shape of it because there's different ones have different shapes. Good, broad, yeah. Do you think it looks small or do you think it looks large? Some of us are saying large. Yeah, I actually think it's pretty narrow or small, especially when you when you compare it to other um other um objects, other storage, other jars or vases or or pyong. Or bottles yeah so yeah the lip it could be flat small narrow good what about the shoulder what would you say about the shoulder of this of this object here flared out yes very good broad broad is very good too good curvaceous wide yes broad round convex yes convex i might be getting my con convex is outward right and concave is inward i might be getting those confused but yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Convex outward gradual. Oh, I like this, this good. So there's kind of a sense of as your eye moves down it, right. It feels like it gets, um, little by little more, um, bulky or bowed or wide. Um, the other word I like to use oftentimes when it's this shape is bulbous, uh, because it gets us thinking about kind of the way like a uh, flower bud kind of works. Right which maybe that is that gradual kind of slope. Good, yeah. So curved, broad, wide, long, bulbous. Um, now let's talk about the foot. So, um, oh, okay, I don't have a picture of it, but let me um, go to the foot really quick. Okay, so this is what a foot and a base looks like. So the foot is this part around. Do you see how it's kind of raised? around this inner circle, which is the base, okay? Um, and this is basically what that vessel looks like, this picture. They just don't have a picture of it on the, for that one on the, on the website. But does that make sense? Do you understand the difference between a foot and a base? So um, something you would say about the foot is it is raised, or it, you might want to look at, is it a very like tall foot? Um, is it a very wide, like, is this portion very wide? Like, does it go in a lot or is it very thin? Because um, sometimes the objects, and then does it even have one or is it just all base, right? It's just all one flat bottom here, right? Okay, does that make sense? I think it maybe makes sense, yeah. So let's talk about the registers. So, um, da -da 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 -da. yes. So are there any registers on this object? So if a register is like a pattern that goes all the way around the object's body, does this object seem to have one? No, it really doesn't. Um, you could also just say it's all one register, right? Um, I'll show you examples of objects with registers later, but um, it, you know, it might be possible that you encounter one that doesn't have registers. So I kind of wanted to exemplify that first. Yeah, exactly. Not really. Um, yeah, so just a, it's a, so you might want to say, yeah, that's just the one scene. There's just this one scene here, right? So within this scene, what are some of the symbols, some of the icons that you see within this scene? 
Cranes, yes, cranes. What do you think all this stuff is here? This kind of plant looking stuff. Bamboo, absolutely. Yeah, it's bamboo. Exactly. So mochis, we have bamboo and cranes. Yeah, so it insinuates um, a pond. Yes, in a lot of ways it does, right? So there's like this crane here who's standing on one leg. Maybe we can imagine it's like in a in a body of water. Um, and the technique. So does anyone think they can uh, guess what technique was used to, to decorate this object? So if you if you see black and white like this, it is probably yes, Lindsay, yes, inlay. Um, so we're gonna learn a little bit more about what that is. Um, and here's just an example of what a displaying this object might look like. So usually they have what's called a stand or a pedestal. It's called bachim in Korean, um, and you can kind of put it within in a little. There's a little hole in the little um, pedestal for you to display it. Yeah, so the inlay technique. So basically what you do is um, you cut into the surface of the vessel after it's been after it's um, been fired once. And then you take slip. So slip is really watered down clay. Um, yeah, bachin just means like stand or bottom which is pretty funny, but yes. Um, so you take your knife, you in, you cut whatever it is you want to um, design into the, into the vessel. Then you take slip, which is really watered down clay. Um, and you put that into, you rub it into the holes that you've made or the indents that you've made by using the knife. Let that dry. And then you're going to glaze the vessel like normal so you can dump it in there or paint over it with more glaze, let that dry and then you fire it. And then after you fire it, when it comes out, it has the, the slip will appear like the white or black color. And then the glaze that doesn't have slip under it is gonna appear that um, green color or maybe more of the brown color, right? So does that process make sense? Because you're gonna see this a lot um and it's kind of conf it can be kind of confusing to understand the big thing is that you understand it's not painting you're not painting the vessel you're not painting it so um you're rubbing slip into or putting you're putting really watery clay into the incisions basically um so what's interesting is that this was believed until really it took the 21st century to be unique to korea that only in korea did they do this technique but actually in Northeastern China, in kilns that were part of the Jin dynasty, um, which was really especially focused in Manchuria, right? That area north of Korea, they were actually doing this slightly earlier than we know Korea to be doing it. So this idea that it's uniquely Korean has kind of, people still say that a lot, but it's actually not, we know using archeological evidence that it's not true. Um, so be aware of that as well. So um, when you interpret a ceramic object, you can ask a lot of different questions about it. Um, and we'll go over some of those here. So what was the function of this object and how do you know based on what it looks like? So what do you think? Um, you know, earlier it kind of said what it was, but what do you think or what are some things you might've used this object to do? If you were in Korea, if you were in Korea, what would you have used this for? What do you think? Hold liquid. Yes, exactly. So earlier it said storage jar, right? Um, professor changed those slides. I, I don't like to talk about what the object does until we figure out what it looks like. But yeah, store liquid. Yes, exactly. It could be wine or water, um, alcohol. Yes, exactly. So that is probably what this was used for originally. Now, how do you know that based on what you see here? What are some things that you see that could indicate that to you? Yes, very good. Very good, Ellie. The narrow and small neck. Yeah, why would that be good for storing something? Yes, mouth is skinny, but the rest is wide, right? Exactly, it's large. Small of I mean, neck. Keep the air out. Good. Keep the air out and keep what? Yes, keep liquid in. 
exactly. So it's very practical, right? It makes sense. Um, you know, usually in Korea, uh, many of these, would they would really have a lid or so, of some kind that they would just sit on top of it. Um, of course, most of those are like lost now because they were just small pieces, right? Yes, exactly, Ellie. Yeah, and it could help direct the flow of liquid as it pours out. Oh, I think you're channeling your, um, did we talk about that, I think, in um, Visual Arts of East Asia? Yeah, exactly, good. Um, so they did not put, so there's two things I want to clarify here, and I, and I don't want to see this in people's uh, visual analysis. Number one, Korea people did not drink tea to the extent that people in Japan and China did. They did not use a lot of ceramics for tea. They use them for what we're talking about here, which is water and wine for the most part, okay? So you might read something that talks about it being used for tea. They are talking about later generations of people because later Japanese people would collect these kinds of objects and they would use them for tea. Goryeo people did not use ceramics for tea, okay? But later people, like the Japanese particularly, did. Okay, so that's the first thing. The second thing is, Goryeo people did not use these objects to display flowers. So something that you're going to hear, especially with this shape, is that it's called a plum, plum branch shape or a plum shape. So later people who collected these kinds of objects, especially these kinds of jars, did display a plum, a branch from a plum tree in these kinds of bottles. Goryeo period people did not do that at least not to our knowledge too much. So I don't want to see if I ask you what was the function of this object, you either need to, I would appreciate it if you could be specific about who would have used it the way that you think they would have used it, or just focus more on like what audio people would have used it for. Okay, so that's my soapbox. Does that make sense? Because I'm going to send you out into the world and you're going to look at museum interpretations of objects and they're going to say different things. But I want you to know for our class, that is the historical facts about the way these objects were used. Okay, good. Yes. So hold something in water or wine. We talked about her shoulder. Um, good. So what do you think is the significance of the cranes and the bamboo? Does anyone know? What do you think? Cranes and bamboo. I would be really impressed with your knowledge of East Asian symbolism, if you knew. Because they had specific um, symbolic meanings to Korea people, particularly, and even people afterward as well. Very pretty consistent. So um, cranes are actually usually associated with Taoism um, and they're symbols of longevity. Now, they're associated with Taoism, but you're going to see them mixed in with Buddhist stuff and Confucian stuff. Taoism, Buddhism, Confucianism, which we don't really touch on those in this course because they're not as um, prevalent in the visual culture of modern contemporary Korea. Um, they get mixed up in, in art and visual culture, material culture in East Asia all the time. So you're going to hear people say, oh, it's Taoist, oh, it's Buddhist, oh, it's Confucian. Well, all of these things kind of go together, though, that you don't really need to worry about specifying that. But um, they're symbols of longevity, right? So what this means is that if you see a crane, if you give someone something with a crane on it, or if someone were to see something with a crane, what kind of message would they be receiving or would they be thinking about? What do you think? What would be the message that you would send to somebody if you give them a crane? Live a long life. Yes, and prosper, yo. Live long life and prosper. Exactly. I hope you have a long life. That's as simple as it is. Exactly. Hope you have a long, healthy life. Good. So bamboo. So bamboo is like strength. Um, it's integrity. It is one of the quote unquote four gentlemen. Um, so there are these four symbols and we'll talk about some of them. Bamboo being one of them, chrysanthemum, plum, and um, what's the fourth gentleman? Is it cherry? It's not cherry blossom. I can't remember it right now. My my brain is lost. But um, bamboo is a symbol of strength because has anyone ever grown bamboo? If you grow bamboo, it grows through everything. 
right? So it bends, but it does not break. It's very hard to, you have to chop bamboo down like a tree. Um, it really is like a tree. So these are standard auspicious um, symbols. Yep. And this bamboo can live for a long time without being watered. Yeah. It will dry out, though, if you put it in too much sun. So what does auspicious mean? If I give you something and I owe it, if you something is auspicious, you're going to see this term a lot. What do you think that kind of means? It's a very fancy word for something very simple. Yes, good omen or lucky. Yeah, it just means like this is a good sign, basically. It really means I'm wishing goodwill upon you or I wish happiness or goodness upon you. Yeah, luck is definitely a part of it. Yeah, luck is not the only thing about it, but luck is definitely a part of something being auspicious. But just general goodness, health, fortune, luck. Yeah, good. Um, and then the question that you're going to answer for your um, for your visual analysis is, do you think this is a good representation of Korean art? Why or why not? So um, we're not going to, we don't, we don't really have time to talk about that here, but I know a lot of you are already talking about that and thinking about it. So, um, so there's a lot of different flowers that are going to show up in with these ceramics. And uh, I want to just go over them really quickly. And this slide will be available to you to use as a reference, of course. Um, I'm not going to dock you points if you get the wrong flower, but there are a lot and they look different. So do your best to try and see if you can figure out which flower is what. So we have this vase here. So this kind of flower is a big flower with a lot of petals and it's very open, if you can kind of tell. And it has vines all around it. Um, this is called uh, bao xiang hua or bo xiang hua. Um, there is not an English word for it. It's just, you can say a bao xiang flower or you can say bo xiang flower because hua means flower. But um, there's not an English term for it. So you're going to have to use this one or just say bosong flower. Um, so this is actually a, a made up mythical imaginary flower, um, but it's a combination of a peony, a chrysanthemum, and lotus, which we're going to learn about in just a moment. And so it integrates all of their symbolisms together into one icon. And so those symbols can be elegance, integrity, purity, wealth, all of that together. Now, a common one on Korean ceramics particularly is this one. This is a chrysanthemum. And, oh, okay. This is a chrysanthemum. So uh, I also want to take the time to talk about registers here. You're going to see chrysanthemums as a, as a common register in Korean and Korea Celadon. So do you notice here there's like this pattern that goes around the top, and then there's another line that goes around the body that's chrysanthemums. And then there's this space in between here that actually kind of has vertical registers. You could talk about it that way with a line of chrysanthemums and then just lines. And then there's a register down here that these are actually lotus petals, but I'll show you what lotus looks like at the bottom. So this is what a really good example of registers look like. Does that, does do registers make sense to you now? Yay yeah, or nay. You can use this as a reference. Use this as a reference when you're thinking about registers. Um, so the chrysanthemum is a small flower and it has this kind of circular interior and it has a bunch of little petals coming off of that circular interior. Um, a lot of times, but not always, but a lot of times these are inlaid. So if you see the black and white color here that's used for the chrysanthemums, um, you can kind of guess, oh, that's probably inlaid, right? So, um, yeah, so they're one of the four gentlemen, um, or the sagunja. They are a symbol of elegance and integrity, and particularly of autumn time. Um, so usually a symbol for a harvest. So if you think about autumn time and harvest, what would be kind of the, um, the message about that? Maybe having a lot of food or a lot of festivity, so maybe like prosperity, something like that, maybe. Um, and, okay, here's the third one. So notice this one is, again, it's this one and, and the Bo Sang Hwa get confused a lot, but they are different. So notice this one has, it kind of looks more like it's looking up. Um, it has a lot of large petals. So the large petals, like wide petals like this, 
um, are very important, but it still has these kind of like leaves and vines a lot. This is a peony. So it's very large. It's bulbous. Um, it has the big petals. Look for the big petals. This is, of course, a symbol of wealth, right? So it's the biggest flower. So, of course, it means wealth. Um, and it blooms in the spring. So it's often used during the springtime. Um, it was often planted at the royal court. Sometimes thought of as like the king of flowers or something. All right. So um, also you can look at these as examples of, so this is actually painted under glaze, the technique. So although it's black, this is actually painted. Um, this is the inlaid. And then this one is just carved or incised with an underglaze, which means that it's been glazed over. So this one, they just took a knife and they cut into it. All right, so the lotus, this is the last one. And there's lots of ideas about lotus, but what this slide says is what I want you to focus on about what the lotus means, okay? So, um, so it has pointed petals, number one. So it kind of has like a triangular, but circle, but rounded shape to it, like in this vessel. Um, and it's usually emerging from water because that's how lotuses grow. They grow out of muddy water and then they emerge and they're this beautiful flower with pointed petals. Um, and that's part of the story of the symbolism. It could be Buddhist or Confucian, doesn't really matter. Um, but purity, so bloom cleanly out of mud. So um, they could be a symbol of that. That's particularly in a, a lot of Buddhist cases is what it is. Um, also a symbol of nobility, right? So um, in Buddhist symbolism, it's particularly referring to um, this, who you don't need to know all this, but this is just to help you understand. You don't need to memorize this, I should say. So there's the Amitabha Buddha, who's the Buddha of the Pure Land. And in the, in the way that Amitabha is envisioned, he's rising out of, a, out of a lotus flower, which is coming out of muddy water. So it's kind of like um, this idea of achieving enlightenment um, regardless or in spite of like the hardship, right? Um, so why is it on ceramics? Well, it could be this reminder to go for those Buddhist ideals, um, or think pure thoughts and actions, right? Um, it could also have been an object commissioned by a Buddhist temple. You probably aren't going to know that, but this is just to explain why this shows up. Um, so like, oftentimes you'll see it like this, especially there's this little person, it's a child actually holding on to a flower coming out. Um, oops, sorry. So this is an example of, um, thinking about or wanting the, the children as a, you know, thinking about children as like pure and the flower as pure, right? Um, for the nobility. Okay. So you might, you might see children, you might not, um, children can mean a lot of different things, but in, with a lotus flower, they're reminders of that purity. Um, so are there any questions about the flowers or about um, the techniques or anything like that? Now we have three minutes and I wanna make sure I go over what you're supposed to do. If you have questions, you can email me and um, I'll address them. So let's look at what you really are doing after class today. So. Oh, where is it? Hold on, let me bring this up. So I noticed that the Word document was actually not available to you. Um, so it is available to you, to you now. If you go on um, Canvas and you go to the week five module, let me show you this. Week five, da, 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 da. and you go to submit ceramic object visual analysis essay. Click on this. It will come up here and you can download the instructions and the guide on what you need to do for this week as a Word document. It also has it written out here. So basically what you're going to do is um, read the description um, and make sure you follow what it says. You're gonna go to the Cleveland Museum of Arts uh, Korean Art Department website. So you're gonna go on theirs. Uh, 
I really think you should just use Cleveland because they actually have descriptions and a little bit more historical information about their um Korean of the their Korean art than other museums do. Um so please use that one. If you find one on a different museum website and you're like, I really want to write about this one, just let me know. Um, so search Gordia Celadon and then look through the objects that come up. Make sure it is Gordia Celadon and not something like Buncheong um, or porcelain because I've had students in the past get confused and write about the wrong one. Uh, look through the pictures. There's lots of different pictures on the website. Um, and look, read all the information, even if it kind of doesn't really make sense to you what it is, the museum information about it. Um, I have a description here of what some of these things mean. Make sure you download an image and because you need to include an image of the object in your final submission. And what you're going to do after you've looked at it for a while is write your visual analysis as usual. Basically what we do um, for the other plenary responses Okay, I have 715. If you need to go, you can go. Like you feel like you you get what you need to do, but I'm gonna finish explaining this. Um, so you're gonna do your description. Make sure you mention the technique. Uh make sure you talk about all the things that are on that list. So the type of object it is, the glaze, the body, and the decorations, right? And the technique within the decoration. Then you're going to do your interpretation. So answer each of the questions, each of these questions. There's one, two, three, four questions for you to answer in your interpretation. So make sure you read all four and answer all four. Um, review it and then submit it by Friday at 11.59 p.m. So like normal. All right. So um, this is worth 30 points as opposed to the typical... 10 points, right? As opposed to the typical 10. Sorry, I'm forgetting a lot of things today. The typical 10 points. So it's worth a lot of points. It should be, the point is that it's an easy way for you to get a lot of points. Um, so please do this um, and do your best. All right. Are there any questions? Thank you all so much. Have a lovely evening. Um, I will finish up the response grades and get your attendance grades out shortly here. Thank you. Let me stop sharing.